Uh, good morning once again. So in many ways, as we continue our look at James, chapter 4 continues where chapter 3 ended. And in some ways, it's an unnatural break between uh, the, two, the two chapters. At the end of chapter 3, James is telling us about two types of wisdom. Sorry, am I on? You can hear me, okay, okay, great. Um, so there was, uh, James is talking to us about jealousy and selfish ambition. And then he moves at the start of chapter 4 to talk about wars, fighting, and passions. So just a nice, easy topic for us this morning, all about wars and fighting. In many ways, though, the answer that James will come to is similar to the answer that Job gets in 28, 28. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. However, James will put it in his own way, as only James can, and that's what I love about this letter. Essentially, the reading today can be split into two. There's the first part, the first five verses, which are the symptoms and the diagnosis of basically what's gone wrong. And then the second part of the reading is much more the good news about looking at what God will offer us. So we'll get to the good news, but bear with me as we go through the tricky stuff and the hard stuff, because that's where we have to start. Of those five verses, James looks in two directions. Firstly, he looks at the fighting amongst ourselves as Christians, as brothers and sisters in the church. And boy, does the Church of England know about fighting with each other at the moment. Just look at what's going on in Synod, and that's all I plan to say on it at the moment. He talks about the broken relationships that exist between Christians and how easy it is to get it wrong. We shouldn't be at war with one another. And I use the term war there deliberately. He then turns his words and says, you don't have because you don't ask God. You've gone away from God. Essentially, what he's saying is that our broken relationships are then causing a miscommunication between us and the Lord. Because our prayers then are ineffectual. The channels of communication with God become affected and possibly even blocked, as one commentator puts it. He points out in verse 1 that the problem of wars and fighting is because of our passions. Verse 3 says that our prayers remain unanswered because if God answered them, he'd be doing so on our passions and not on his glory. Tough words as we begin this exploration this morning. We've got things so, so wrong. We've let our own passion come into the church. Now, don't get me wrong. Passion is, can be a good thing, but it's when it's selfish passion that it goes all wrong. It's when we start using our selfish desires and our passions in the church that leads to a breakdown of relationships between brothers and sisters within the church community. It's when those selfish desires and passions are used to inform our prayers that things tend to go wrong and we, start stop, we stop seeing answers to our prayers. So where are our hearts this morning? Where are our passions? Are our passions based on our selfish desires and ambitions? Or are our passions based on the glory of God and what he wants for his world and what he tells us that we should focus our passion on? Are our passions misdirected? As I say, it's tough stuff this morning. As I mentioned a couple of weeks back, I'm listening to Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools, and I shared a little snippet with you. I've continued listening to that more and more over these last couple of weeks. And one of the things it's really challenged me on is, am I praying in the right way? Am I praying to God for the things of God, or am I simply giving God a wish list and asking him to fulfill what's on my wish list? Because guess what? If I'm doing it that way, it ain't going to work. And I think too often in the church, we've become too focused on our own desires and our passions and our own ambitions that we pray in the wrong way. And then we start having those discussions of, well, God hasn't answered my prayers. 
That's because we're praying in the wrong way, as James tells us. Because we're praying from our own passions. We're not praying with the Spirit of God dwelling in us to, about the, what God wants to do. We need to get on board with what God is asking of us. Are our own passions going to be fulfilled? Or are we going to seek the will of God? James uses strong language when he talks about the relationship breakdown. He uses the language of war, fighting, killing, wage war. Now, he doesn't mean actual killings here. The language used is metaphorical. But it should not take us away from the force of them and the horror of them. They're very deliberately used. And in many ways, I think in the 21st century, we lose the impact of those very words because we have in some ways become desensitized to war on a large scale. We see it every day on the news. We see what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. We see what's going on in the Middle East, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Israel. And we sort of become desensitized to it because we see it every day. The first hearers of James's letter would not be as used to this. They would be used to the Roman occupation. But when he starts talking about wars between the Christians, it'd be, whoa. And I think we need to take on board what he's saying here. That it is, it's a horror. It's a, it's a big thing. And it is very strong words. After all, as we think of our present day, Rhetoric over you, nuclear war is getting more and more. Russia keeps saying, if you do this, then we'll send a nuke your way. In Israel and the Middle East, there's all the things of, if you do that, then I'll do this. And if you do that, then we'll do that. And it's all threats that's building up and building up and building up until something will break. And essentially, that's what he's saying within the church. If we argue with one another, if our relationships are not right, it will continue to build and build and build, and then it will spill over. And that, I think, is a position the Church of England finds itself in today, that our arguments have spilled over into society. And it's not a good place to be. War is brutal. War is not kind. It really put it into context for me. Because last week, Brendan, David, and I were with the St. Mary's men on a walking weekend. And last Sunday morning, we went to the National Memorial Arboretum. And it really brought war to my mind. I hadn't quite factored in that James was mentioning war in James 4 when I, when I, was, when I was there last week. But as I walked through that memorial, I don't know if you've been, the memorial where all the names of those who have been killed in the line of duty since World War II, it brought tears to my eyes. As I went to look at the shot at Dawn Memorial, I stood there and wept. Those that were shot because of cowardice or because of a lack of understanding of PTSD, it's shocking, it's horrific, and it should cause us to be horrified. It also brought to mind a time when I was with the naval chaplaincy, and I was in a briefing on board a ship, and the chaplain said, bear in mind, if you end up in a situation of conflict, the enemy will want you dead. And I sat there and thought, flipping heck. It really brought it home to me. That this is not just a bit of fun. It's not just a jaunt on a ship to see all the wonderful parts of the world. There could actually be, if there was a conflict, these guys would lay their lives down for their country. It was so shocking. I can remember what the room looked like, where I was sat, who was in the room, and exactly the conditions of it all. So, where are our hearts? Are we praying for the things of God? Or are we focused on our selfish ambition, which will bring war, which will bring division, which will bring fighting within the church? We are self-willed. We covet things. We want things. That's the way the world teaches us to. It's meant to shock us. It's meant to not just overlook those small disagreements and squabbles we have with one another. Because we start to see the effect of what happens. Our prayer life suffers. Our relationship is with others is important because it reflects our relationship with God. When we see unanswered prayer, we think it's, be it's because we are praying on our own passions and not because we're seeking to get alongside God and what He is doing. Because in many ways, there is no such thing as an unanswered prayer. God is simply saying to you, no. 
If you're praying for your own passion and it's not right, God will say no. And we are too full of ourselves to hear that word from God when he says no or not yet. We say, oh, God hasn't answered my prayer because it's not the answer that we want. In the first chapter of James, he wanted us to know if our hearts were loyal to the Lord from whom we seek wisdom. Here, he tells us that our hearts are now loyal to our personal satisfactions. James doesn't say that God does not hear our prayers. He just says that we are the ones that do not receive from God. As I say, it's often a no or a not yet. We act like children when we're praying with God to God. When I see Hannah and Joseph, when they're doing things that they're not supposed to be doing, and we say, no, stop. They try and push the boundaries a little further and see what they can do, and then it's a bit more of a, no, stop. And then if they get too far, it's, freeze. And I think essentially that is what God is doing to us when we think of it as unanswered prayer. It's because God is saying, no, no, freeze. Because if we continue in that direction, we're going the wrong way. And we're going away from our relationship with God. He wants what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. Do we trust him enough when we are praying? Do we trust him enough to answer our prayers? Or are we too caught up in our own selfishness to actually hear what God is saying? So essentially, we need to cleanse our hearts be able to step into prayer in the right way. And this is what James is leading us to, cleansing of the heart. It's the beginning of the wisdom that he wants to share with us. He, in many ways, as one commentator puts it, he has to frighten us first by using this language of war and killing to get our attention, to get us to accept that we've got it wrong, so that we can then start to turn our hearts back towards God. And notice In James' writing, he doesn't have a list of the things that we've done wrong. Like in Paul's writings where there's lists, James just says, we've got it wrong because we've got the wrong motives. Blanket. He then says in verse 4, you adulterous people. It gets worse before it gets better. We're in love with the world and not with God. He's using the language of marriage, which we see throughout Scripture. He's saying we are in love with the world, which means we are having an affair with the world, so we're not, in, we're not devoting ourselves to God. So our problem, friends, is a spiritual one. How do we get right with God, and how do we stay right with Him? Are our hearts and passions set on worldly things, or are they set on the things of God? Are we going to pursue the things that God intends for us? Or are we going to continue to seek out those things which bring us instant gratification that is soon gone? Now, this is not to say that we leave everything from the world behind. It's not to say we sell our house, we, we, look, we don't accept the promotion, we get rid of all our money. It's not to say that. Because those things come from God when we follow His will. They just cannot become our primary objective, which is what the world wants us to think. So that's pretty much doom and gloom. It's not good. That's what James is saying. We've got it wrong. We're in a complete mess. So what do we need to do? We get to the turning point in the chapter, chapter verse 6, where James holds out a lifeline for us. It's not a 50-50. It's not a phone a friend. It's not ask the audience. It's a lifeline. It is that God's grace is available to us, and it is abundant. God provides the means to follow him. Even if we have cultivated a relationship with the world, which is what the enemy wants us to do, because it takes us away from our primary calling as a Christian, it's not too late for us, because God gives us grace. The Lord gives us wisdom. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us forgiveness, salvation. There is Jesus Christ himself on the cross crucified for our wrongs of which we will celebrate later in this service as we gather around the Lord's table. None of us, friends, are too far from the reaches of the Lord. This is the crux of what James is talking about, really, that we need to turn away from the world and our sinful natures, turn away from our selfish passions and desires, and turn back towards God. 
In Greek, the word used is the metanoia. It's changing one's mind. It's turning back to God. It's having gone the way of the world for so long and then saying, enough is enough. I am turning round. Lord, I am coming back to you. Have we reached the metanoia in our own lives, in our own journeys with God? Are we ready to turn around and say, Lord, I've got it so wrong, but you give us grace. You, I know that you will, you will come and restore what has been lost. He invites us into a renewed fellowship with God. Submit yourselves to God, he says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Those are amazing promises that we read. But I think we often read them and overlook them because it's well known. But what does it actually mean? He's reminding us Elsewhere, the teachings elsewhere in the New Testament, that even though Satan has his grips on the world, possibly ourselves, his power has been curtailed because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's reminding us that when we resist, like Jesus did in the desert, the devil will flee. All the things we've explored in that first part of the passage will fall away because they are things of the enemy. War, desire, self-satisfaction, selfish ambition. They're all things of the enemy that he wants us to have. But they will then be replaced by the things of God which are grace and humility and coming near to God. So in many ways, James has carefully laid the groundwork out in his letter up to this point. He's taught us about purity and evil. He's then become quite specific in chapters 2 and 3. And now having established that portrait of evil, he commands renunciation while reminding us of the gracious forgiveness of God. And it shouldn't be lost on us that he uses typically Jewish explanations here. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. He talks of our hands and our hearts, which is a very Jewish way of thinking. So basically, when all's said and done, forget what I've just said. The call of James is basically to reorientate ourselves to God. That's what he's getting at this morning, really. And all of that stuff, the bad stuff will fall away. If we reorientate ourselves to God and his purposes of the world and move away from our selfish desires and that which the enemy wants us to keep focused on. He talks a lot about the errors of the church and boy, yeah, we've got it wrong. But he comes back to forgiveness, the forgiveness that is available to us if we draw close to God once again. That requires forgiving others. It requires forgiving ourselves. And those are difficult things to do because the human condition makes us very good at holding grudges. You've wronged me. I'm going to hold on to this because it's hurt me and it's going to stay with me. That's not what the Lord wants from us. He doesn't want it to keep us captive he wants us to forgive others so that we can be free and that we free them as well. But we have to humble ourselves before God to be able to do any of this. When we've got it wrong, whether by omission or commission, we need to be humble before God. We need to allow the sacrifice of Jesus to wash us clean. We need to allow Jesus to speak into our hearts to restore what has been broken, to restore those broken relationships, to restore what's gone wrong in the world. Because then we will start to live out our lives in the way that Jesus is asking of us. There is in many ways a strong call to community, a community with a spirit of humility and forgiveness. That's completely different to what the world expects. And that community of humility and forgiveness should be the church. But are we humble? Are we forgiving? Answers on a postcard. We are a community that is built on the word of God. We need to take away the things of the world that creep into the church so that we can protect it for the things of God. Because when we get things right in the church, we can then be effective as the church beyond these walls into a community which needs to hear about Jesus Christ. 
When we start to pray to the Lord about what he wants, rather than our own desires and ambitions, we will start to see the nation changed. New Wines tagline, local church is changing the nation. Bring it on. I want to see the local church change the nation. But we can't do it unless we humble ourselves before God. We have to get our priorities right. So really the call is, are we going to humble ourselves before God today? Are we going to say to God, yes, I'm sorry, I've got it totally wrong. Are we going to reach a metanoia in our relationship with the world and say, enough of the world, enough of the enemy, and say, here I am, God, use me, take me, I am your servant. Which do you want, friends? Perhaps it is a 50-50 after all. Do you want the way of the world or do you want the way of God? The way of God is not easy, but it brings eternal salvation. The way of the world is instant gratification, but it brings death. Are we going to become a community that is humble? Are we going to become a community that is forgiving? Because if we are, we need to have a time of serious self-examination. We need to look at what desires are pulling us away from God and lay them before him. Because the world will try and convince us to keep going with those desires. It'll say, the enemy will say, it's okay, you spent five minutes talking to God, now watch two hours, binge watch or something on Netflix. Or, well, it's okay, you've been to church this morning, you spent an hour and a half worshipping, now for the rest of the day I want you to go and do all this stuff in the world. That's what the enemy will try and do to us. He will tell us that we can't resist him because his his, his appeal is alluring. He wants us to get in, in, in with him. But what is James saying? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then the Lord will come near to you. The devil is a coward. He's an absolute coward. When we say to him, actually, no, we can resist you, he will flee. And when he will flee, when he flees, God will draw close to us, which means that we can start to make the impact in the world that the church needs to make. So what if we're to take those promises seriously? What if we are actually going to draw near to God? The church and the world would be totally different. So let's have a time of self-examination, friends, quite simply. Where have we got it wrong? Are you willing to make that turn today, that metanoia in your own life, to say enough of the world and more of you, God? Are you willing to give God those selfish desires and ambitions and leave them with him? So that your heart can be on fire with the things of God. It's not an easy task. But it's a worthwhile task. When the enemy says you can't resist. Turn around to him and say yes we can. Be gone. Because you ain't welcome here. You ain't welcome in the church. You ain't welcome in my life. Because I have the power of Jesus Christ. And I have the authority that he has given me. So let's learn to use that authority that we have been given and the enemy will flee and then we can draw close to God. Let's pray. Father, we're sorry for the times that we've got it so, so wrong. Father, we're sorry for the times when our own ambitions and desires and passions have got in the way of what you want for us. Father, we want your church to be a place of humility and forgiveness. Tear down our pride. Bring us to our knees, Lord. Speak into our hearts. Remind us of the authority that you have given us to say to the devil, he has no place here. We want to draw close to you. We want to live our lives as you intend us to live them. So we offer ourselves to you afresh this morning in complete and utter surrender. Lord, would you allow us to examine ourselves, to go into those deep places, to bring them before your throne so that you can remove them from us to allow us to be free, to be your hands and feet to a hurting world. 
Father, we long to be known as a local church that's changing the nation. Help us to do that, Lord. enemy has no place here. He has no place in our lives. And with the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, we command him to flee. To flee from our lives, to flee from our church, to flee from our homes. We claim that authority this morning. And say to him, you're a coward. You don't belong here. Because our hearts are set on the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again for each of us. That is who we proclaim. That is where our hearts are. So let's proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in all that we do. And let's not slip back into the ways of the world. But let's keep our minds and our eyes focused on the person of Jesus Christ. Because he is the one that will bring restoration. He is the one that will bring an end to the wars, to the fighting. He is the one that will bring glory to this world. So we rest in his presence this morning. And we say, draw near to us, Lord. Come and do what only you can do.